Dr. Niall Smith and all of the staff at BCO have been such an integral part of our Dark Sky story here in Mayo. If you ever get a chance, if you're ever in Cork and you get a chance, please visit the Black Rock Castle Observatory. It's an amazing, an amazing place, architecturally, historically, and every which wise. And the, the, the team there do amazing work. And almost from the, the start, they have been with us in, in spirit and in body at the Dark Sky Festival. Niall and Claire and the rest of the team, they bring their mobile planetarium to Mayo every year and allow people to see the night sky in their mobile planetarium with really, really skillful presenters. Claire herself has given an introduction to astronomy course, that's Claire Sweeney. And Niall, I think, has given us three talks. He'll correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but last year he gave a talk of, you know, what does Ireland have to gain from space 4.0? And that was a really interesting talk about the latest developments in space exploration. And he also hosted what had to be the highlight of last year's festival was um, a, a conversation with uh, astronaut Bob Thursk of NASA, who had spent six months in the International Space Station. And Niall hosted a talk between um, Bob and our own astronaut in training, if you like, Dr. Nora Patton. And was, Bob's talk itself was uh, mind blowing, but uh, the way that Niall handled the the um, the dialogue and the conversation afterwards was just very heartwarming. And it was just uh, you had to be in the room. That's what I, uh, that's all I'll say. Uh, so once again, Niall joins us for our 2020 festival. If not in person, then he is presumably sitting in the comfort of his own home in Cork, although he's a dub originally. Uh, he's sitting in Cork now um, with a PhD in astrophysics from UCD. He was actually a, a founder of the uh, of BCO in 2005 and has been with them ever since. An amazing advocate for knowledge, for scientific discovery, for communicating. Um, we are really thrilled to have him with us. We were during our rehearsal. <laughs> I hope Niall won't mind me saying this, but during our rehearsal yesterday, Niall was telling us that he is, you know, we're all on Zoom these days, but he was telling us that uh, he's doing a wine appreciation course on Zoom. So I only hope that he wasn't doing his homework for that particular course before coming on tonight. Um, but what he's going to talk to you about is the freely available Stellarium application, which allows you to view the night sky um, from wherever you are in the world virtually on your screen and this allows you to then plan your actual night stargazing um, on a particular night and in particular conditions um, it's an amazing resource and i think niall will sell it and explain it better than anyone else and without further ado i hand you over to dr niall smith well i'm glad i managed fiona to actually unmute myself uh, so thank you for the uh, the introduction. Uh, unlike Kareem, I don't have a glass of wine in this instance uh, to go with the talk. Although having just what you said, uh, I, I feel like I've missed out on something, <laughs> something now. I, I must admit I'm sitting here in Cork feeling very intimidated uh, for a number of reasons, mostly because the quality of what we've seen so far has been really outstanding. I really enjoyed Kareem's talk uh, as well. I didn't get to every talk today, unfortunately, but I would like to say that it is a, an honor for us at, at Black Rock Castle Observatory to be part of this, um, uh, this, this, this amazing event. It's, it's more than an event, it's, 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 a, it's a momentum, it's, a, it's, a, it's not just a festival. It, it really is lovely to be able to go to, to visit and stay and meet people face to face. This year, because we don't have that, it doesn't appear to be suffering. I think we will all want to return to seeing the skies uh, next year, um, or at least talking underneath the skies, even if it's cloudy. I think that adds something to it. Tonight in Cork, it's, it, it, it's, it's, fairly, it's fairly poor. For a Halloween night, uh, actually it's fairly poor, most nights in Cork, if truth be known. Um, but when we do get to see the sky, I guess one of the issues that have been discussed during the day is how do we take the most advantage of that? And I, I'm, I'm going to um, uh, 
talk this evening um, uh, about uh, this um, package Stellarium, which we use at BlackRock. It's freely available, um, and I will explain a little bit about it. But I do want to take the opportunity to, to talk about why being able to see the stars and so on also is important to us and where this kind of takes us. Uh, because there are some things, and, and I would like to kind of dovetail into what Kareem said at the end of his talk before going into Stellarium, that a huge amount of what we know about our, our as, as a species comes from being able to look up and see visually in the first instance the skies above us. So in the last number of years since the space race started, so 50 years ago thereabouts, we start to become familiar with satellites going above the atmosphere and taking images of the night sky. But actually, fundamentally, most of our understanding of the, the basic constructs of the universe started uh, before that. It started with visual observing, followed on then soon-ish afterwards in terms of the scientific method, by the use of telescopes. And we all know of Galileo being the first to turn the telescope towards the skies in a way that actually had scientific impact, although he wasn't the first person. He certainly wasn't the person who invented the telescope. But fundamentally, what he was able to do, and some of the visual observers before him, like Tycho Brahe and Johannes Kepler, uh, was to challenge a view that the Earth was at the center and therefore the most important object in the universe. In fact, an object that might have been serviced by the rest of the universe. And that fundamentally gives us all a perception of who we are, how important we are. Uh, and it turns out that while we are fundamentally important in terms of the universe, the universe looks on us somewhat differently. So every time we go to consider about pollution, about wastage, about protecting the planet, we do so increasingly in the knowledge that uh, the rest of the universe really doesn't care what we do to this planet. So it really is up to us to look after it. We wouldn't know that if we couldn't see the stars above. If we couldn't look out at the stars, if we couldn't look out at these points of light in the night sky, we would have perceptions of ourselves and they would be unbounded. There'd be no way to constrain them. There'd be no way to say, whether a particular view was right or wrong. In fact, for most of modern history, we've had the wrong view of the universe. So being able to see light fundamentally has already impacted what we know about ourselves as a species, and it should never be underestimated. The other thing that just struck me when Kareem was talking before coming on to talking about Stellarium was we've never sent uh, any spacecraft to boldly go where no one has gone before in the strict sense. We've always sent spacecraft to places that we've viewed first from the surface of the Earth and had a pretty good idea they were pretty interesting places to go. And we can only do that again because we started off by being able to see through this atmosphere of ours and out into the, into the, um, into the cosmos beyond. So everything that we've done has really fundamentally been important uh, by, by having the ability to see. But increasingly, unfortunately, and I'm not going to have a negative talk at all tonight in terms of where we're going, but increasingly it's not just the light we can see with our eyes that is becoming polluted and challenged. It's other wavelengths that we can't see with our eyes, but which give us invaluable information about the universe. For example, if we want to detect water on other objects, we really can't really can't do it effectively if we look at it with the wavelengths that our eyes offer us. We need to go to other wavelengths to do that. And water is fundamental for life, so we need to be able to see at other wavelengths. Some of those wavelengths uh, um, for water, the problem is our atmosphere is full of water, so we really need to go above the atmosphere if we really want to get a good idea of what's going on in the universe. So I guess the, the, the first point is, being able to see your universe is the best way you have of under, understanding. And uh, the atmosphere for us is therefore all important. So onto Stellarium, and I'm going to wander around a little bit, uh, not uh, hopefully in any incoherent manner. But I wanted to start with Stellarium by pointing out, for those of you who, who know nothing about it, 
uh, it, it's, it's a package which is available for um, pretty much any platform uh, and it's free um, and it is updated uh, very regularly. Uh, it, there are a number of different ones, by the way. I'm not going to talk about other types. We use Stellarium a lot at, at Blackrock Castle at the observatory. Um, but it, it's really, one of the things that we like about it is it's solid. It does what it says it'll do, and it works very robustly and very well. And it gives you an enormous number of options as to what and how to explore the sky around you with it. Right now on, on this image, I'm showing the moon. And of course, I think we probably all know it's a full moon tonight and it's Halloween. And so uh, that's great uh, for werewolves and it's great uh, for uh, trick-or-treating. Uh, so that's great and let's celebrate that. But actually in general, the moon, unless you're looking at the moon when it's fall, is a real nuisance. And it's a real nuisance because it's very bright and it's a real nuisance because we have an atmosphere. And when you put an atmosphere and a bright object together, irrespective of pollution, just because the atmosphere itself has constituents in it, because by definition, it can't be not there and there at the same time. So because the atmosphere has aerosols and it has dust and all of this, the normal good stuff that's in the atmosphere, it, it acts to scatter. And the scattering means then that the light from the moon ends up being scattered back into your eyes, well away from the moon. Of course, during the day, the reason why we have blue skies is also because of that. But the sun is so much brighter, the amount of backscatter is so large that we can see really nothing during the day other than a blue sky. Now, blue sky is very nice. And again, that's great. But if we want to see what's out beyond that blue sky, which really is all generated in about 35 kilometers of uh, atmosphere above our heads, then, then actually we need to wait until it becomes nighttime. And so a bright moon is a real nuisance. So. Let me not want to be uh, somebody who is, um, uh, uh, let's say, ruining the uh, experience for, for everybody tonight. But if I just move the, the, uh, the, 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 the image here from Stellarium, I'm going to zoom out a little bit. This is a view looking south from Ballycroy. So you can actually, some of you will, will recognize some of the things. I don't know how well it comes out on the, on the image because it's kind of grayed out at night, but this is Clare Island here, for example. Uh, and you can see that Jupiter and Saturn are at the moment just slightly uh, to, the, to, the, to the west of, of Clare Island. Um, if we look at the, at the sky at the moment, by looking at the sky, you learn a lot immediately. And one of the things I think has been coming through today is just look. So go out and just look. Often we hear astronauts and the overview effect. And this is the effect that they talk about, about looking down on the earth and how fragile it looks from above. And I'm, and I'm always perplexed by why nobody has talked about the underview effect. Because I know when I go out and look up at the sky, I, I feel really fragile because it is this enormous sense of something above, which is so much grander, so much bigger, so much more eternal than me. And I think, uh, for me, if, it, if you're under a really dark sky, it's kind of scary. The, the sky above looks almost like it could do whatever it wanted at any time. And, and I talk with friends, I've talked to um, um, uh, colleagues of mine who do astronomy and those who don't, and they all say, yeah, you know what? When you kind of look at the sky under really dark, under dark skies, it's, it's, it, it really sort of gives you a sense of, of scariness. So don't be afraid just to go out and look around and know three or four things about the sky. Know that what you're looking at are really are objects that tell us something about ourselves and objects uh, that we can identify now more easily than ever because we have the likes of Stellarium. So if I look here, the bottom right, I can see Jupiter. At the moment, there's Saturn. If I continue in pretty much a straight line, I'll go on to Mars. And if I continue in the, onto a straight line, I'll come to Uranus. So at the moment, I have set Stellarium because there's so many different options in it. I won't go through all of those. In fact, I definitely won't go through all of those. But I've set it to be showing a lot of scintillation or a lot of twinkle. So I hope you can see the stars are twinkling. And what you might notice is down here, for example, Fommelholt. So if I click on it, it tells me something about what star I'm looking at. If I click on it, you can see it's, it's or if I look at it, you can see that it, it is twinkling a lot. I can actually 
zoom in a little bit and I can see that indeed it is twinkling a lot. Higher up in the sky, the stars twinkle less and the planets, actually Mars there, is really not twinkling at all. So if we were to just look with our eyes and see what the sky is telling us, we would immediately see some differences between objects that were low down and in towards the horizon and some objects that were higher up and points of light. And we'd see that, the, that there's a it's twinkle twinkle down here, which doesn't happen higher up in the sky. And so really what we're seeing here is the effect of looking through a lot of atmosphere when you're low down, close to the horizon, and less atmosphere as you look up overhead. So as you look up more overhead, you see you're seeing you're looking more through less and less atmosphere. And then the atmosphere has less chance to bend and twist the light that's coming from those objects so they don't twinkle as much. But so these other objects that don't seem to twinkle at all, that should tell us that maybe they're a bit different. So if we were being good scientists, we'd say, well, why isn't Mars, why isn't Saturn, why isn't Jupiter actually twinkling? Well, they are a little bit, but really very much less. And, and the reason is because they're extended. So unlike every other object in the universe, pretty much, there'll be one counterexample I'll come to at the end, uh, everything else is pretty much a point, a point object in the sky. But Jupiter, for example, is, is very far from a point object. And before it sets, if we take a chance to, to zoom in on it using Stellarium, we can, we can see that Jupiter um, is uh, here. And we can see at the moment, because Stellarium updates this in real time, we can see that it has four bright points of light, which are the four Galilean moons, so-called because they were discovered by Galileo. They played a fundamental role in changing our view of the universe because Galileo noticed that night after night, these objects, these moons moved uh, around Jupiter, uh, or, or they moved and they, and they kept on moving and moving in a repeated fashion. It was complicated repeated fashion, but it was a repeated fashion. And his conclusion was they must be going around Jupiter. And that fundamentally disagreed with the view at the time, which was that everything went around the Earth. So a simple observation made possible because you could introduce a little bit of magnification in the first instance, so a telescope, and secondly, because you could see the objects, because you didn't have light pollution to any great extent. I mean, Jupiter is very bright, but these four moons are less, much less so. So if we click on them, the, 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 the uh, Europa here is just at the limit of naked eye visibility. If you have really good acute vision, now generally Jupiter plays uh, uh, makes it pretty much impossible. I've never seen it, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't claim to have perfect vision. And as you can see, I'm wearing glasses. But with a telescope, you can resolve these things easily. So this encourages us, of course, then to go and make instruments that allow us to see the sky a little bit more clearly. So we'll leave Jupiter there to continue on its, on its, uh, on its way. And it's, you'll see in a few minutes that it will be, it'll be heading downwards and heading, heading south. So um, if we look back uh, to, to something I was saying a minute ago, we have actually, um, so we have Jupiter here, Saturn here, and as we move on across the sky, we can, we can start to see that Mars, Jupiter and Saturn all line up in a, in a nice line. What this actually allows us to understand is that they all go round the sun together in the same plane. So it tells us a huge amount by the fact that the planets all are in a line tells us that we all are in a solar system, as, as we now call it, where we have a star and all the planets go round as if they're on a plate. Uh, that's, that's an important observation because it tells us something about how our solar system is formed in the first instance. And in fact, it leads in very nicely to the idea that uh, by being able to see the fact that Jupiter, Saturn, and in fact, if we, if we, if we go out a little bit further, if you come out to, 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 uh, to Uranus, then you actually can see that they all line up together. So everything in our solar system is, uh, is going around on the, on the same plane. So our atmosphere is, is something for us that uh, is, is, uh, is, is, is important for us on the planet here, but it's also really important for us from, from uh, the point of view of how we see the sky. So I'm gonna just do something here for a second. I'm going to take away the atmosphere. So at the moment, I've set Stellarium so that uh, we have 
a, a typical atmosphere in a low light polluted area. In fact, we've really got no particular light pollution in this sky at the moment. What we have got though is the bright moon and what we've also got is um, a normal atmosphere which is scattering that bright moon. Imagine the atmosphere didn't exist. So now I've removed effectively the atmosphere. So Stellarium gives you a sense of what the sky might look like if the moon wasn't there or if I remove the atmosphere. So just to explain that, the only reason why we're seeing some light scattering tonight is because the moon is causing, the, uh, is, is causing that sky glow. So even if it was really clear in Ballycroy tonight, you're not gonna get perfect uh, viewing of the sky. You're going to be challenged by the brightness of the moon. Astronomers, when we go and observe at different telescopes, if you're given what they call dark time, that's time when there's no moon, that's the premium time. Time when the moon is up, unfortunately, is, uh, is time which is less desirable because the contrast is, 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 much, is much less. So the, the planets themselves then also tell us something. If I, if I, um, if I sit here on Mars for, 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 for a second, and one way I can, I can do is if, if, I, if I go to a series, and, and I, 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 I'm just maybe for, to give you a quick sense, if I go along the bottom line to a series of controls here, I can make Mars centered in my view, and then I can just, I can keep track, I can do things with the sky, I can allow the sky to rotate, and Mars doesn't rotate with it. So that's actually very handy if I want to see what Mars is doing over a period of time. So if I, if I, for example, move uh, forward or move backwards, I can watch what happens to, to any object in the sky as, as, as I change the timing. But actually, rather than Mars for a second, what I want to do is I want to look uh, a bit further north. Now, for those of you, we talked about the, um, we talked about the Milky Way. If I go more towards the northeast, at the moment we can see that in the northeastern parts, which, which, where it always is, you will have the Milky Way. If I turn the atmosphere back on because of the moon at the moment, it gets a bit uh, washed out. But if I want to find some objects that are particularly of interest in the night sky, and I want to find the North Star, for example, well, I've got a number of different ways of doing that. I can switch on constellation lines, for example, and for those who are a little bit familiar with the constellations, uh, then Stellarium allows us to label them in various different ways. And if I, if I um, uh, decide to run the, the, the clock forward a little bit and I watch the way the stars move in the sky using Stellarium, then if you keep an eye on one star in particular, you will notice that it doesn't appear to move. In fact, if you look uh, above uh, Bundor here, the, the mountain, you'll see that there's only one star which doesn't appear to move with respect to it even as we allow the time to go on. And that, of course, is the pole star, and that's the star that the Earth's axis is pointing at at the moment. So the Earth, actually, when it started off about four and a half billion years ago, its axis was pointing upwards, uh, and then it got hit by an object the size, roughly, we think of Mars, got tilted over, and in that tilting, uh, it, uh, it, its axis was changed to 23 and a half degrees. 23 and a half degrees today uh, um, points at the pole star um, and it's in Ursa Minor. But I can change the date that I want to look at any, uh, any configuration. So I'm at the moment I'm looking at what, what we're seeing tonight. Suppose I do something a bit strange. Suppose I go into the search window. Oops, apologies. Let's suppose I don't go into the search window. Let's suppose I go into the date and time window. And instead of the year 2020, I decide I'm going to go to the year um, roughly 15,020. So roughly 12,000, 13,000 years into the future. 13,000 years into the future, this, if I let the, if I move the um, sky here, the sky looks very different. Instead of the pole star being Polaris, there's Ursa Minor over here, so there's Polaris. It's actually the star Vega. So the Earth is rotating, uh, is like a spinning top. And at the moment, Polaris down here is our North Star, 
12,000 years ago, Vega was the North Star, and 12,000 years into the future, uh, we'll be back to having Vega as the North Star. Tonight, Vega is definitely visible. I'm going to turn off the, uh, the, 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 the constellation lines, but if I move back towards the south, I get to see above um, Jupiter and Saturn, and I will zoom in just a small bit, I get to see three stars which uh, form the, uh, you probably think the, unaptly, the, the not aptly named Summer Triangle. So Altair, Vega that we've just said a moment ago, and Denim. So Deneb is in the, uh, they, they're in three different constellations. Again, I can turn the constellation lines back on and I can turn the labels on. So Deneb is in the constellation here of the Northern Cross or, or, or the Great Swan. Vega is in the constellation of Lyra and Altair is in, is in Aquila. But if I look at those stars and I try to think, well, what do they tell me about the night sky? Do, is it just that they're nice to look at? Why would I want to look at Vega? Why would I not want to look at something else? Well, Vega is particularly bright, so that's a good start. But if we look and use our eyes, and this was mentioned by Kareem, if you, when the, 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 the sky brightness is very low, your eyes are inclined to switch into black and white mode. But if you allow them, their 20 minutes with no mobile phones or anything else to recover, then you can start to see colours in the night sky. And if you look at Vega, you'll see that it is an intensely blue colour. And intensely blue, we now know, uh, goes with something bluish white, goes with something that's very hot. And in fact, if we click on this and I go up to the, the top here, we'll see that I'm getting some information about the, 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 the star Vega. Um, and, uh, for example, its distance, which in this case is 25 light years. Now, for those of you who are less familiar with light years, 25 light years is really on our doorstep. Uh, so the, the, the farthest things that you can see in the universe are many billions of light years away. So 24 light years, and our, and our own galaxy is 100,000 100, light years across. So 24 light years is really on your doorstep. So the, this is a very close by star that's very bright. If we examine it further, we actually see that it's only about 500 million years old, and it's only going to last for about another 500 million years because it's much, it's about two and a half, three times bigger than the sun, our, our, our own star, and bigger stars get hotter. And when they get hotter, they actually last much, much shorter time. There's a, there's a kind of a, an interesting relationship between how big and hot you are and how long you last. So it's a bit like the James Dean, you, you, you last, you burn bright, but you don't live very long. So Vega is a star that's not going to live very long. It's going to live for maybe another 500 million years. The sun has already been around for four and a half billion years. So if we're looking at the sky and we're thinking, I wonder, is there life here? Well, there might be, but it's probably not the best place to go looking because we know that life has taken in, in, in this instance, four and a half billion years, pretty much, and Kareem talked about that fraction of a second towards the end of the, of the year. We've only appeared, even life has only been on the planet in any, in any detectable uh, um, form uh, for a much, much sh uh, um, uh, shorter period of time. Now, there was life on the Earth 500 million years ago, but it wouldn't be detectable in, in any uh, meaningful way from space as things stand. If we had more time, we might actually have a discussion about that. But so Vega is probably not a great place uh, uh, to, to, to look at if you want to, to find life. The other reason is that a star like that is very bright, or sorry, it's very hot, and hot means a lot of UV. We all know what UV does to our skin, for example, and that really means it's breaking up molecular bonds. But you also get X-rays, and it's also a variable star. So not only is it variable, not only is it also a double star, but it also has a lot of lethal radiation, um, which would, it, it, seem, it seems difficult to understand how life might, might thrive in, in those conditions. So looking at something that's bright and blue, or just intensely bluey white, you might think, so what? But actually the sky is full of the so what? Well, the so what is something, and it can be something really important. We can, for example, instead, uh, go and look for um, a, an object uh, that is um, that is not hasn't quite quite risen. Let me just turn off these things. This remember is real time, so just 
if you're in Ballycroy at the moment, it's just this, uh, this um, particular star, Betelgeuse, it's just rising above the horizon at the moment. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll cheat a bit. We'll just run the clock forward a little bit. Cheat might be a little bit uh, unfair on ourselves. And we let Betelgeuse rise a little bit. So if I look down here, roughly around midnight, just a little bit before midnight tonight, some of you will be familiar with the constellation of Orion. I'll come back to that in just a second. But if I look at Betelgeuse, then Betelgeuse actually, although you don't see it so well here, is a star that is really quite red in color. And red stars uh, are, are, are cooler stars. And interestingly, there's two reasons why they might be red. One is they're very small, so they don't have enough fuel to make themselves uh, any other color. Or like Betelgeuse, they're very, very big stars. In this case, red, uh, Betelgeuse is a red giant star, which if you put it where the sun was, we would be pretty much sitting inside its outer envelope. And, and Betelgeuse is about 11 times more massive than the sun. And we have this, this really interesting conversation, and many I know of the people who will be attending today will know lots about this type of, 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 uh, of discussion. Uh, Betelgeuse is a variable star, and, and there's a view that it's probably going to blow itself in a supernova explosion within the next 100,000 years. Could be tomorrow, it could be 100,000 years. Recently, it dimmed a lot and it created a lot of excitement associated uh, with its dimming because there was a sense that maybe that's a precursor to it going to explode. But that all starts, the idea that when you look at it, it's intensely red, tells you something fundamentally about it. So by just using our eyes on one part of the sky and we see Vega blue, and on another part we see Betelgeuse red. Betelgeuse is pretty much at the end of its life. It's bloated itself and as it bloats, it gets cool. Vega is in the middle of its life. So Betelgeuse has had a very short life, even shorter than Vega. And again, not a really good place to go if you want to try and find life. But what it does underline is don't just look at the sky and say, there's a bunch of stars, they're twinkling, and that's not very interesting. Twinkling tells you we have an atmosphere. That's really important. If you were on the surface of Mars, for example, the stars wouldn't be twinkling uh, because Mars doesn't have any uh, reasonable atmosphere, enough of an atmosphere to cause the stars to twinkle. Um, so if you look at, at colors, then you can get some sense of how old the star is. I should just say, by the way, that the largest number of stars in the sky are all invisible to us. They're too faint for our eyes to see. They're M-type dwarf stars. They're stars which seem to be really in abundance in the universe. We've only started to learn this in the last 20 years or so. And now, interesting, we're also starting to find that not only are there lots of planets around other stars, but hidden even out be it with outside of what Stellarium is able to show us, there are lots of rogue, rogue planets which are wandering between the stars. And that's a really interesting discovery because it could be that there are as many planets on the wonder as there are anchored to their sun. But if you want to look at the, at the sky for somewhere where stars have been formed, then one place to go is to look at, 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 a, at a nebula. And again, Stellarium, if you know the name, for example, of one, so I'm going to do the horse head. It's, it's, it's pretty much already uh, in, 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 in the image here. Anyway, I'm going to go to the horse head nebula. And if I zoom in, many of you might be familiar with just the way um, that that looks. Uh, it, you, can, you can tell immediately why it's called the horse head nebula. But this is, a, a, this is dust which is being uh, generated by stars which are being formed. And so this is a stellar nursery. There's a, a, an associated nursery just sort of down to the bottom right in this image M, M called Messier 42. And so we can see regions in the sky where stars are bor being born. We can see the likes of Betelgeuse where it's about to die. And we can see the likes of Vega, which is kind of halfway through its life. So by looking around, being able to look a little bit closer than our eyes can see, but still critically important, being able to see through any atmospheric turbulence or atmospheric haze that we might generate or atmospheric pollution, then we can tell so much about what it is uh, that is in the universe around us. 
And there's lots of these different nebula. Another one that I particularly like is the Crab Nebula. Uh, and for, for a number of reasons, because it's also a different type of two ones that we've looked at so far. The Crab Nebula is, the Crab Nebula is actually a star which blew up uh, roughly 400 years ago now. Um, but it was named by the third Earl of Ross in Burren County, Offaly, when he observed it with a 36-inch telescope, and he thought it looked like a crab. But the Crab Nebula is the remnant of a star that has exploded. The Horsehead Nebula is, is stars that are forming. So you start to see the galactic zoo is available to us all. And all of these objects are, are, are visible with relatively modest sized telescopes. Now, you will see a lot of them as fuzzes of light. Don't let that make, be a negative. Because here, here's the thing, imagine that you can look at the Crab Nebula and you can know that that's a star that's exploded. Why? Because we've been able to detect that light and we've been able to use our brains to figure out what was the cause of that. That's a, that's a really good thing for a species to be able to do. But if we lived on a planet without over-egging the point, that was shrouded in dust. And we know they exist, for example. You could be in a large dust cloud. Planets and stars exist in large dust clouds. Then you wouldn't see the universe outside and you wouldn't maybe know that stars explode. So we're very fortunate where we live in our galaxy that we have a view pretty much unencumbered to a significant percentage of the universe. And we're lucky that we've lived on a planet where the level of light pollution has been sufficiently low for sufficiently long that we've been able to tell something fundamental about, um, about the, the, the planet we're on and, and the universe that we live in. So with, um, with, with, the, with the approach that you can take with Stellarium, you can start to sort of to fiddle around. You can just either have directed or you can be undirected and you can, you can, you can see um, what, what it is that might be of interest. But Fiona mentioned this at the beginning, is you can then plan, of course, what's what. Because, if, for example, here we can see that the constellation of Orion is nicely above the horizon. Um, and that tells me by midnight, I should be fairly confident that I can go outside and see uh, the constellation of Orion. Uh, whereas if I if I try to do it now, so if we go bring it back to the to right now, well then we see that actually the constellation um, is is just is actually hidden down here. So we have to wait before we can actually see uh, Orion uh, rising. So it's a, it's a very handy tool from that perspective. Not only can you say tonight I want to see an exploding star. I wonder where exactly it is in the sky. Is it up yet? When might be the best time to see? Indeed, the best time of year to see it, of course, not just the best time of any given night. Um, and because of that, it, it allows you to get a re it gives you a really powerful opportunity to um, to, to to see what's going on in in, in the in the sky. I, I want to finish um, by just uh, moving the sky on a little bit to uh, tomorrow morning. Um, here we have roughly six o'clock in the because uh, I wanted to say just a couple of words um, about, well, two, two objects, actually, if I just run it a little bit further. So um, you'll see that at the moment, Mercury, uh, it's not quite as far from the sun as it can be, but it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a reasonable distance. You can see the solar, the glare of the sun now starting around 6.50 tomorrow morning. But Mercury is visible at the moment. If you've never seen it and you want to have a look at it, uh, it, it now is an opportunity. One caveat, always be really careful when you're trying to look at Mercury. It's always close to the sun. And if you're not careful and you're using something like binoculars and that you really need to know what you're doing. So do not encourage smallies to look for Mercury uh, with, with any sort of visual aid. Indeed, even with the unaided eye, you really need to know uh, what, what it is that, that you're doing. Um, so it's an opportunity, but please always be careful uh, with, with Mercury. Venus, on the other hand, well, it just jumps out at you in the, in the, in the sky at the moment. And, and Venus, um, the reason why I think it's, it's, it's interesting, and just to finish the, 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 this uh, uh, talk, and, um, is that many of you will have seen recently the um, announcements about the potential uh, life on Venus. Um, and so 
this comes from the, the detection of phosphine, which is a, a very toxic chemical, which is very hard to make. But something other than in industrial processes, the one thing that does make phosphine is, um, is, is, is light. There are certain bacteria that make phosphine. So there's a really interesting conundrum here. Either there's some very strange chemistry going on on Venus, uh, or there is potentially some sort of bacteria. Now, why this is so interesting, of course, and so unexpected is, and, and this is why I wanted to kind of finish with this, is that uh, if we had been giving this presentation last year, we would have been saying, you know, it's all about Mars, because Mars is the place to go to look for life. This year, uh, it's a little less clear. Maybe Venus is an interesting place to go to look for life. In fact, you could argue that we've had a stronger signature from Venus than from Mars. So the, the, the thing here is that science and being able to look and being able to detect and look out of the universe uh, continually challenges what we started off talking about. Because if this really is from some bacteria, then it begets the question, did that evolve on Venus? Uh, was Venus actually our twin planet all along, as has often been claimed? because really it was the one, the other one in the solar system with life. And then importantly, did it evolve, as I say, on Venus? Or did some asteroid not part of the Earth out into space and it fell to Venus and seeded Venus? So have we seeded life on another planet already unbeknownst to ourselves? None of the questions, these questions have answers yet. That's why it's so interesting, because the question when you don't understand the answer is, What's the question I need to ask so that I can work towards getting an answer? So um, I wish I had the type of graphics and so on that Kareem had. Uh, I, I think that was a stunning uh, set of graphics. But with the likes of um, Stellarium, you can start to look at lots of different objects in the sky. But what I would suggest is when you do, ask yourself, well, what am I looking at? D don't just make it postage collecting stamp exercise. I mean, do to some extent, but, but then ask, why does that look the way it does? Is there something about it that's telling me something about the universe that my ancestors may not have been able to determine? Allow your mind to explore the universe in all senses um, when you go out and look at it. And hopefully we can continue to do that if we can take the Mayo Dark Sky Festival and other dark sky initiatives. If we can use those to protect our skies, we can have our kids and our grandkids going out and looking up and saying, I can see that star is not, not that I just see it, I can see it's red. And why is it red? Now I start to really become that sentient being in the universe, which does something that most of the universe doesn't do, which is ask questions about itself. For those of you who know Carl Sagan, he made a quote that I'm going to finish with. We are the universe becoming aware of itself. And so use that awareness when you go out to the night sky, when you've planned your session, to actually ask and see if you can come up with an answer. So um, I will leave it with that, Fiona, um, and I will actually I'll leave that on there. Wow, thank you. That was so I'm very aware, Fiona. There's probably a million people who are experts to learn users who are at the moment going, oh my God. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, it, it's it, even a novice like me in terms of using it gets, gets great use out of it. And maybe I would make that point. You don't have to be expert. I'm not. It probably showed. Absolutely. Now, no, that didn't show. Your enthusiasm certainly did. You know what, what I find is very, and I don't want to put you on the spot. But, you know, uh, and I know there are lots of experts out there, but there are also lots of uh, neophytes out there, such as I was maybe two years, three years ago. And what I love learning to do was doing a bit of star hopping. And I started with uh, the plow and find just the simple step of finding the North Star from the plow, from the pointer stars of the, the plow and then following the plow through to find Cassiopeia. So I don't know if, if that's something that you could maybe show us on the screen and talk sure. a little bit about star hopping. 
Sure. No, th thanks, Jonas. So actually, I I'll, I'll take the opportunity um, to, to uh, start with Arcturus, because some of you might know there's this kind of phrase of arc to Arcturus, where you, um, so what, I, what I'll do is, I'll, first of all, I'll just point out the plow. I mean, I can show the constellation lines. I actually, I'll do that first minute, but, but unfortunately they show Ursa Major, which adds in a bunch of other lines, which aren't part of the plow as such, as, as we know it. So the plow is going to be these ones. I'm gonna turn off the lines in a second, if I do that. So if you take these three, and I've just dropped it down. If you take these three in the handle of the plow, you can come down to Arcturus. Now Arcturus isn't quite what we call circumpolar. It's not always there from Ireland, but it's there a lot of the time. Unlike the plow, which is, so we call the plow circumpolar. So it's, it, it, the, the, the first thing to do is looked to effectively now at the moment you'll see that the plough we're looking almost due east so you get the three stars in the handle the four stars in the pan and what you can do is if we just move this over a little bit is take the two stars at the end of the the the, the, the pan handle and move to the brightest star that you first come to. Now, I have to say, Fiona, and you will know this from, from the star hopping, it's not very bright. The, the, the uh, Polaris is not the brightest star in the sky or anything like. So it, it doesn't jump out at you. It takes a little bit of getting used to it, I think. Um, but if you take, again, the three stars in the, ha in, the, in the handle, then the pan, and then you go up, to, you'll get to Polaris. About so, five times the distance. Sorry. About five times the distance, yes. Um, I can see you're, 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 oops, you're an expert star hopper, uh, so. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, so, uh, so if I, actually what I'll do is I'll zoom out, maybe just then to make it a little bit, little bit easier. So we're back to the plow here. And the Polaris here. I bet people can already spot Polaris from your instructions there. Okay, great. Well, that's great. And, and to be honest, and thank you for saying this about, by the way, star hopping, because this really is a good way to get to, to, to get to know that we used to do this as, 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 as kids all the time. Incidentally, just before, so Cassiopeia will be the far side of this, which I'll come to in a second, if I can get, if I can, if I can get my version of, um, let me turn off the atmosphere a second, if I can get my version of uh, it to behave, and this is just me, and my apologies, let me do a, oops, a, a zoom out, Fiona. Okay. Yeah, you're there. You can I just start to see there. it. Yeah. So if you, if you take the, the, um, the, 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 the plough and you go through the plough, on the far side, you get the W of Cassiopeia. So, um, and in fact, what you can do if you're unsure for this, you can get a better sense here. It looks a bit distorted because of the way that, the, it, this has been shown at the minute in Stellarium. That's my fault, not Stellarium's fault, incidentally. So you can get a sense then, if we go back, here's the plough, out to Polaris, and then roughly out the far side, you've got to take a little bit of a right turn at Polaris. Um, so so that, th th that's something. If you go, uh, and, and that's a very th good constellation, those are two good constellations to learn. Another one that I think is really nice, if you take the two lower the stars in the constellation, they kind of show their way towards the very bright star Capella. So we always learned, you know, straight straight, straight to Capella. And, and we, we, we used to say, plow, plow your way to Capella. So we kind of thought of the plow going in this direction and you would come to a star which really is quite bright Capella. Uh, my, my, I lived in the countryside for a number of years and uh, when we bought the house, we went to the, to the well, just before we bought the house, we went out to have a look to see what it looked like in the dark and some very interesting conversations with that previously. And the star that was pretty much overhead on that night was Capella. So we named the house Capella. So um, uh, I, I, I thought that was right. Love that. Uh, um, but, and then the, the, in, in Pisces, just Castor and Pollux to, to the right. The, the, these are very, very, um, very bright um, objects uh, and, and pretty obvious. It, it, just one other thing, Polaris in this direction, if you go towards the right, now, some people love to do lots of star hopping, and I know some of the names 
uh, that I see who are here today would do multiple star hops. I'm going to assume that people uh, are, are more like me and, and, and try to take a simpler star hopping approach. So uh, we, we learned as well that to go towards Regulus, you went to, the, in this instance, to the right, and the first bright star that you come to is Regulus. Now, you can do a better star hop than that, for example. Everybody has their favorites. So, um, another one, by the way, for those of you, just in case, for those of you who, who haven't um, seen, uh, I'll just zoom out a little bit, uh, um, Constellation of Orion, uh, it's very obvious, and it's although it's a winter constellation, as we saw, it will be visible tonight. The three stars in the belt of Orion, you really can't miss that at all. It's really the probably the, the most easily defined what we call asterism or, or, or grouping of stars which are not physically co-located. Uh, co um, and if you move up towards the, 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 the right, you'll, you'll get to Taurus and Taurus, uh, and, well, to Aldebaran in Taurus, the ball. Um, and so that's, a, that's a, a nice way as well. So we, we kind of, you know, would, would uh, uh, have, have, have started with Orion. It's a great consolation to teach kids, actually, because it's so dominant. And if you go to the left, you'll get to Sirius. But in reality, Sirius, because it's the brightest star in the sky, um, it, it, it's pretty obvious, I think, for, for a lot of people, um, once it's above the horizon. But if, you, if you're not sure, the three stars in the belt of Orion will absolutely direct you towards it um, in, in, uh, sort of unequivocally. So, um, so there will be a few uh, of, the, of, the, of the, 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 the stars, Fiona. Thanks, Niall. We love a bit of star hopping here in Mayo. <laughs> well, can I say one of the things, things, of course, uh, we, we miss is is the walks at night um, oh. and 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 looking up. So uh, uh, absolutely. So next year, next year, next year, next year. So Niall, do you mind if we put a few of the questions that are coming through? Sure, if they're um, easy, if they're hard, no, please. <laughs> and you'll let me be the judge of that. <laughs> Uh, Terry Mosley is asking, first of all, he says thanks. And he's asking, does Stellarium update meteor radiant positions according to the date? It, 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 uh, it can do. Um, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't do it uh, automatically for all meteor radiance. I was looking actually at that earlier today for another reason. So there is a, there is, um, a, a manual update that you can do to it uh, if, it's, if it's not done. It does it for some of the brighter ones. So, for example, the Leonids later on is one of the ones that appears in the list. Thank you. And uh, Mark Hanna is asking, is the Stellarium mobile app worth using or should it be run on a PC or laptop? Yeah, so it, it works fine on, on the mobile app. Um, I, I have a, a fairly old um, Samsung um, uh, three or four years old. It's nothing special. And it, 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 it runs fine on that. What I think is um, is always a challenge uh, is is to make sure that you, there is a nice mode on on uh, um, on Stellarium, so it it, it 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 turns it turns red. Um, but I would say use it sparingly. Yes, it's definitely it's definitely a good thing. But be careful about the uh, the if possible about the overuse of it because it destroys your night vision. Uh, even when you have it in night mode. In in my experience, it, it, any any mobile device at all. Uh, does that so it, it, it's great good for learning good good initially and when you get a little bit more competent try, try to try not to use it if, if you if you can and try to sort of memorize what you want to look at so that's that be my maybe i'm a little old-fashioned but i find it hard to to use those uh, and not and then be able to see it it takes me a while to recover i'm going to go slightly off topic uh, from stellarium but richard sessions is asking and i know you're going to love this question any comments on the Starlink satellites and their effect on astronomy? For example, the Rubin Telescope. Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. So, um, and 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 that, that that's a great question with a very, a very difficult answer. So, um, uh, I actually had um, a couple of slides. That's that's an example for, for those who are less familiar of um, of a Starlink. It is an old one. There's been a lot more. So, the Starlink satellites are low Earth orbit satellites designed to provide communications. Um, and uh, the issue that um, nobody seems to have really realized in advance 
was if you're going to put up somewhere between 12 and 30,000 of these satellites, uh, that their brightness at the moment uh, is going to cause havoc with wide angle surveys like the 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 the, the, the Rubin tele, the Vera Rubin telescope. So uh, w we had a workshop last Friday uh, discussing the future of, uh, and this is discussed in many fora, uh, discussing the the future of space, and what is the trade off between, for example, at, well three things very quickly. L low Earth orbit satellites, I'm generally a fan of, and, and I, I mentioned this last year at, at, at the Dark Skies, not I'm a fan because they offer possibilities to provide communications to communities, particularly in, in disadvantaged parts of the world, which we're, we're, we're going to find very difficult mm -hmm. otherwise. So that's a, that's a positive. The problem at the moment is that uh, I think the guys in, in SpaceX didn't really think about the astronomers, just never crossed their mind. Mm -hmm. Astronomers never thought to, th to, to talk to the guys in SpaceX. That conversation now has started. The second that SpaceX has tested two types, and by the way, I'm, I'm no apologist for SpaceX, but there is a third point to this, Fiona. Uh, SpaceX has has launched two different types of of of, of a, a Starlink, where the there is a reduction of somewhere between ten and thirty percent, still way too bright. Um, but th th they're starting to try to see if they can do something. Uh, with, with, with reducing the brightness of the, of the satellite. But the third thing is, so, so at the moment it's a problem and it will be a problem for Vera Rubin and, and that's, that, that's a worry, that's a big worry. Um, but the third thing is that this now gets us to say, well, how do we then, because we haven't had to worry about this before, how now do we make spacecraft that basically reflect much less than they did? And there's really interesting research papers starting to come out about materials and all that that may be able to do that. I would be personally hopeful, actually, I would say it too, I would be really disappointed if we're not smart enough to figure this out and make these, these black. I know of no fundamental law of physics that makes it impossible for us to, 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 to significantly reduce the brightness. There's going to be some streaking on very deep images, and we're going to have to figure ways as an astronomical community to then all sort of that. It, we're literally, it's interesting, but we're going to be sharing the sky with people that we never had to, 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 to think about before. And, and just as a final thing um, on that, and we could go on, I'd love to have to go on with this much longer, have a chat back and forth rather than a monologue from me. But we were, during the first lockdown, I was outside with my wife and, um, and, 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 and her son and, and um, girlfriend, there were the four of us out there. We were out till about three in the morning just chatting. I haven't done this in ages. But the number of satellites I saw really... Wow surprised me the, the the sky has really like i used to do this a lot when i was younger we used to meter observe all night and you'd see the odd satellite here it is really starting to get obviously visually crowded so it's a concern it, it is absolutely a concern i just hope we're smart enough a little bit like with the light pollution and the type of stuff that Karen and, other, Karen, Karen and others were talking about today are smart enough to solve it i i i, I believe we are and i and, and we have to <laughs> we have to do it Thanks, Niall. You're always so positive, I have to say, even though you look at both sides of the story, you always seem to come out of the positive side. Um, I think we will leave your chat at that, but please just stay on the screen because we're, we're just about to wrap up for the day. Um, I don't know about anybody else, but I'm a bit exhausted, but I have had an absolute ball today. Um, it's been the first time that we've ever tried a virtual event. Um, I, I still hope we will be able to welcome you all back to Mayo in person next year, but I think the opportunities that a virtual event presents to us are fascinating. And I think we've been able to reach people that just would never have thought of coming to visit us before. So I'm very, very grateful for that. And very grateful to you, Niall, for your, your uh, fascinating introduction to Stellarium. I would stress Stellarium doesn't replace going out looking into the night sky because nothing beats that, but it helps you to plan your, your night sky viewing a little bit better. I think that's what it is. What are you going to look for? What are the conditions going to be like? Should I be looking north? Should I be looking south, etc.? cetera? So what, what you did there was perfect. Thank you. Um, I don't think we have too much time for questions. Um, but I would like to say one thing uh, before we finish today, and that is to acknowledge 
uh, the winning of the Hogue Robinson Award by the International Dark Sky Association for Brian Espy of Trinity College here in, in Ireland, in Dublin. Brian is a longtime friend of Friends of Mayor Dark Skies. Well, more than a friend. He, he has been instrumental in everything that we do. And this year he won the Hogue Robinson Award for input to national policy and education on light pollution. Uh, I just don't think we could let the day go by without acknowledging that. I hope Brian is still in the room and listening to us. But even if he isn't, please pass on our congratulations to him. We spoke with Brian about uh, a week ago or so on a virtual call and, you know, we congratulated him on this. And his biggest thing was, you know, Ireland is punching above its weight. And that, that's, what, that's what it meant to him, that Ireland as a country, it wasn't about him and about his award, but that Ireland as a country is, is playing its part in, on the world stage in terms of tackling light pollution and best practices and all that. So, Brian, if you're listening, we want to say thank you from everyone, a friends of my Mayo Dark Skies. And uh, Niall, what can I say? Thank you, as always, masterful, a safe pair of hands to put the final talk of the day. And I hope encouraging people after learning about bats, about boulder chambers, about Halloween uh, traditions, uh, about light pollution and how to tackle it in cities. And uh, I'm sure everybody's shouting at the screen now, reminding me of all the things we've learned today. But I thought it was a fitting end to remind people that um, it's so important to take a moment, look up and understand what you're looking at and understand how privileged we are to be able to see what we see in the night sky. And uh, I think with that, we will end the evenings uh, or the day's uh, festivities and thank everyone, including all our speakers and Niall and all our speakers for joining us today and say, uh, I hope we meet in person someday in Mayo. And I hope today has given you a flavor of the kind of uh, things that the Mayo Dark Sky Festival and the Friends of Mayo Dark Skies are about. And if not, I don't know what more we can do. <laughs> but thanks, everyone. And uh, have a lovely evening. And enjoy the rest of the weekend. Thanks, all. <laughs>